Welcome to Bird Ultrasound. In this presentation, I'm going to explore some of the muscle bellies that we look at routinely when performing a shoulder ultrasound. It's part of my standard routine to try and document all of the muscle bellies when I scan a shoulder. So I use the butterfly view to look at the long and short head of biceps muscle bellies. I use the suprascapular notch view to have a look at the supraspinatus muscle belly. And then I do a short axis assessment of the infraspinatus sitting above the teres minor in the posterior shoulder. And what this allows me to do is to not only assess the tendons of the shoulder, but also ask the muscle bellies how they're going. And looking at the muscle bellies provides a lot of additional information. It provides information about uh, the chronicity of tears of the rotator cuff. So for example, if you tear the supraspinatus tendon, uh, if it's a fairly acute tear, the muscle belly will be well preserved. And as that tear becomes of greater duration, then the muscle belly will begin to atrophy, etc. So if we have a look at the posterior shoulder, we can see some nice anatomy in the posterior part of the shoulder. And the anatomy we have here, this is the spine of the scapula. And above that, we have the supraspinatus muscle belly. Uh, so given that this is the spine of the, of the uh, scapula, then the word supraspinatus makes good sense. It's superior to the spine of the scapula. And then, of course, this that then becomes the infraspinatus muscle belly, sitting immediately inferior to the spine of the scapula. This is teres minor, and this is the deltoid muscle. And this muscle coming up through here is the long head of the triceps. So if we have a look at the bony anatomy, as well as the spine of the scapula, we have this little groove in here, and this is the suprascapular notch. And then we have another little groove coming around here, which is the spinoglenoid notch. And through those two grooves runs an important neurological structure, which is the suprascapular nerve. So this nerve runs down through here, it arises from the cervical spine and uh, comes off of the brachial plexus, heads posteriorly, goes through the suprascapular notch here, and then does the motor innervation for the supraspinatus muscle belly. It then continues its path down through the spinoglenoid notch and then does the motor innervation for the infraspinatus muscle belly. It can come into grief in a couple of ways. It can come into grief at the suprascapular notch when we have a superior labral tear. So if you look here, we can see there's the humeral head and the glenoid, which means that the superior labrum is this location. And then if we have a tear through the superior labrum, a paralabral cyst can form in this location. It can then impinge upon the suprascapular nerve and that will cause a de of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle bellies. Alternatively, if you look here again, you can see the posterior glenohumeral joint here, which means the posterior labrum is in this location. And if you have a posterior labral tear, then you get a, another paralabral cyst. It then accumulates in the spinoglenoid notch, causes a similar compression effect, which will then render function of this part of the suprascapular nerve, render it useless. And of course, then we'll have infraspinatus muscle wasting. They're the two muscles that we can see that are innervated by that suprascapular nerve. We also have another nerve, and this is the axillary nerve, and this comes off a little bit lower down. It has no relationship to the suprascapular nerve, so it's a completely different piece of wiring. And it's uh, steeled with the task of doing the motor function for this muscle here, which is teres minor, and this muscle here, which is the deltoid. It's not the only innovator of the deltoid, but it certainly is a significant contributor. So if this nerve, the axillary nerve, is damaged, then we expect to see de-innovation of teres minor and a proportion of the deltoid muscle. So when we look at the posterior shoulder and think to yourself, why have we got muscle wasting in, in this quartet of muscles? The most common reason that you're going to have muscle wasting of the supraspinatus and then plus or minus the infraspinatus muscle as well is nothing to do with the suprascapular nerve. It's just that you have an older patient with a chronic tear of the supraspinatus that is then perhaps 25 or 30 millimetres wide, which means that it's also destroyed a reasonable amount of the footprint of the infraspinatus uh, tendon, which renders both supraspinatus and infraspinatus unable to, to work effectively and you simply get atrophy of these two muscles that's not from de but from tendon damage. There's also another possibility, and that is uh, an entity called Parsonage-Turner syndrome. Now, Parsonage-Turner syndrome is a brachial plexus neuritis. It loves nothing more than to walk up to the suprascapular nerve and turn it off so it's not functioning anymore, and you get quite a rapid atrophy of, of supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle bellies. 
Thankfully, it's often transient, so it will come back and, and the function of these two muscles will be restored and the muscles can rebuild over time. So when I'm looking at a shoulder ultrasound and I'm seeing patterns of atrophy in these posterior shoulder muscles, I look at the demographic of the patient, I look at the health of the rotator cuff, and then I try and ascertain whether I think we've got a parsonage turner, whether we've got a tear of a tendon that's causing the problem, or whether it's a de innovation problem caused by either an extrinsic compression or some other damage to the suprascapular nerve or the axillary nerve. And of course, the patterns are quite easy to recognise. So it's a bit like having a sort of architect's view of three rooms of a house here, if you like, with the little swinging doors here and, and uh, three sort of bedrooms all side by side. We've got the supraspinatus room, the infraspinatus room and the teres minor room. And to provide light to these three rooms, we need to have a suprascapular nerve uh, wire that comes in and that goes to the supraspinatus muscle belly. And then that same bit of wiring then continues along and has a second room that it services, which is the infraspinatus. We then go back to the junction box and we start again with a fresh piece of copper cable and we run that one all the way around. This is known as the auxiliary nerve and this goes to the teres minor. So we have this nice, beautifully lit up house with three globes that are all working nicely, thanks to two primary wires that come from the junction box and then of course the suprascapular wire then divides to provide function to both supraspinatus and infraspinatus. So you can see here we have the two wires doing their jobs and of course, we may then suffer a problem. And if you have a disruption of the suprascapular nerve at this level here in the suprascapular notch, then this is quite commonly caused by a superior labral tear and a paralabral cyst displacing the nerve at this level. Then what we're going to have when we have a disruption at this level is we're going to get dysfunction of the supraspinatus muscle belly and infraspinatus muscle belly. So we're going to get atrophy of these two muscles. We will, however, have preservation of teres minor and the deltoid muscle because the axillary nerve will not be affected. So this is effectively what's happening here is this suprascapular nerve is being disrupted at this level here at the suprascapular notch. And what that leads to is these two lights being turned off so that we have de innovation of both the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle bellies simultaneously. If we have a disruption at this level here, which is at the spinoglenoid notch caused by a posterior labral tear, then we have a slightly different pattern where the supraspinatus muscle belly will be preserved, but the infraspinatus muscle belly will get atrophy change. And of course, we also have preservation of teres minor and deltoid. So this is simply what's happening here is we've got a problem with the suprascapular nerve at this level here. That means that the supraspinatus muscle belly remains bright and normal, but the infraspinatus will be turned off. And of course, teres minor has no problem because the axillary nerve is not affected. Then we can have an axillary nerve disruption, and this is typically caused from a dislocation event, and it can also be a post-surgical complication where the patient's had some surgery on the rotator cuff and they've managed to damage the axillary nerve. It can also be affected by Parsonage-Turner syndrome. And it's also not that uncommon, actually, for me to see axillary nerve dysfunction just randomly in people that I'm scanning, uh, for especially older patients that I'm scanning at their shoulder, and it's, it's almost certainly asymptomatic for them, but they've just lost their teres minor and part of their deltoid because the axillary nerve, for whatever reason, has just become dysfunctional. And you see that randomly from time to time. So if we have a disruption of the axillary nerve here, for whatever reason, then of course we're going to expect to see teres minor atrophy and deltoid atrophy. So this is the pattern, and of course we'll have preservation of supraspinatus and infraspinatus. So this is like interrupting the green wire here, the axillary nerve. So supraspinatus and infraspinatus will stay bright and the teres minor will be turned off. It's really interesting to look at the atrophy pattern of supraspinatus because it's not as you would necessarily expect. If you have a look at this beautiful picture here, and this is simply a view of the suprascapular notch here. So we know in the bottom of this groove here, we have the suprascapular nerve, and we know that that is the motor innovator for this muscle here, which is supraspinatus. And then of course, it goes around through the spinoglenoid notch to innovate infraspinatus as well. But if we look at the anatomy on this picture, you can see this is the trapezius muscle here. This is the tendon of supraspinatus, and it's a bipennate muscle. So it's got, it's got muscle arising from both sides of this central quill, if you like, almost like a feather running down the center of the supraspinatus muscle. 
Deep to that, we have the supraspinatus muscle tissue itself, and of course, slightly superficial to that quill that is the central axis of the tendon of supraspinatus, you also have the muscle, the meat, if you like, of supraspinatus. And then we have this little triangle here, which is a little triangle of fat that sits between trapezius and the superficial surface of the supraspinatus muscle. If you have a look at this anatomy, it almost looks like you have a feather sitting here with, with a sort of bipennate pennate type arrangement, so the central quill, and then above this, if you look at that, you can then draw the, the, the muscle bellies. It looks like you've got two triangles of muscle that are both pointing this direction, and then you've got one triangle pointing backwards this way. And if you see this pattern, this is what we expect to see with a healthy, normal supraspinatus muscle belly. So it's what I call two positive triangles, you've got two nice um, in this case, purple triangles pointing this direction and a small triangle pointing in the negative direction here. So this is the pattern we're looking for when we're looking at the muscle bellies. This is just scanning through in real time so you can just appreciate the way that that is just a little thin slither of fat. It, uh, it is not part of any muscle, it's just a thin layer of fat sitting between two muscles between trapezius and supraspinatus. If you then look at this patient, it looks quite different. And this patient actually has significant atrophy of the supraspinatus muscle belly. And let me explain how we can see this. So if we look here, this is the trapezius muscle here. And then this is that central quill. This is the, the tendon of supraspinatus. And then deep to that, this is the muscle belly of supraspinatus attaching onto it. And this makes quite a nice, strong, positive triangle here heading the right direction. However, we have this very large negative triangle heading the wrong direction, and that is some fat. So what's happened here is this is significant atrophy of the supraspinatus muscle. And when we have significant atrophy, the muscle that is superficial to the central tendon disappears and becomes atrophic, while the muscle underneath it is relatively well preserved. So it's an asymmetrical atrophy pattern. If we look at this patient, you can see a similar pattern. So here's the trapezius muscle. Here's the central tendon of supraspinatus. Here's a strong positive muscle belly heading the correct direction here, but here's a very small muscle belly on top heading the correct direction, and there's a large negative triangle heading the incorrect direction, and this is all fat. So this can't be muscle because it can't be that shape, it can't be triangular heading that direction. Uh, the muscles are going to be triangular with their apex towards the tip of the acromion over here. So this person doesn't quite have as severe atrophy of their supraspinatus as the last patient, but they certainly have significant atrophy change. So how do I look at the infraspinatus and teres minor muscle bellies when I'm assessing them for atrophy change? So we need to come around now to the back of the shoulder and we place the transducer in this almost sagittal orientation with one end of the transducer just underneath the spine of the scapula and this gets us in a short axis orientation of this muscle which is infraspinatus and this muscle which is teres minor. The resultant picture is this one here, where this is superior and this is inferior. This is the infraspinatus muscle belly here, and this is the teres minor muscle belly here. And when you get this just right, you get this free, if you like, free little glimpse of this muscle here, which is the long head of triceps coming up from underneath. So because this muscle infraspinatus is innervated by the suprascapular nerve, and this one is innervated, the teres minor is innervated by the auxiliary nerve, they have separate wires providing them with their motor function. So it's very unlikely that you're going to get atrophy of both simultaneously. So this is a clinical case that we came across during this recent week of work. And this is a young gentleman that turns up with shoulder pain and weakness. And when we have a look at his suprascapular notch picture here, so I've got the transducer lined up along this green line here, and I'm scanning down into the supraspinatus muscle belly to have a look at the suprascapular notch. We can see we have zero atrophy. It's beautiful. We've got a really nice central tendon and two very strong positive triangles here and virtually no fat in the negative direction here. So this is a normal example of a very healthy and strong supraspinatus muscle belly. When we came around though underneath the spine of the scapula and we have a look at the spinoglenoid notch, we saw this feature though. And this is a large ganglion sitting in the spinoglenoid notch. If you then also look at the labrum here, the posterior labrum, it looks very unusual. Now, I'm not a firm believer at all that ultrasound is useful for looking for labral tears, but I'm quite happy to comment on a labrum that looks like this where it's really very unusual, echogenic, irregular, and there's clearly a paralabral cyst arising from it. So the presence of a paralabral cyst makes me very happy to say that there's a labral tear. And unfortunately, this paralabral cyst has grown into this area here, which is the spinoglenoid notch, and it's now causing compression on the suprascapular nerve as it comes out from underneath.
So what we're seeing here is as the nerve came through the suprascapular notch here, it was fine, and it's done a really good job of, of motor innovation of the supraspinatus muscle belly. But then when it comes down to this level here, it's impinged upon, and the infraspinatus muscle belly has undergone some atrophy. So again, this is just a nice video showing that really degenerative or torn looking posterior labrum and the large paralabral cyst. Now if you've got eagle eyes you'll notice that this muscle here is the posterior deltoid and the muscle sitting on top of this ganglion here is all infraspinatus and you see how this is much brighter than the deltoid muscle here and this is a clue for atrophy. In this case what we're seeing is we're seeing an interruption of the neural supply here at the spinoglenoid notch by virtue of the posterior labral tear and the paralabral ganglion cyst. So then when we have a look at the muscle bellies and we scan them in the short axis, you can see that the muscle belly here is teres minor and the muscle belly here is infraspinatus. Now the infraspinatus should be probably about two thirds of the muscle bulk on the posterior scapula, but you can see it's struggling to even be 50% here. The teres minor really looks like the dominant muscle, which it should not be. The other thing you notice is the infraspinatus muscle belly is really echogenic and the teres minor muscle belly is nice and hypoechoic as a healthy muscle should be. And then if you use as a reference this posterior deltoid, you can see how beautiful and black that is. So clearly this muscle here, infraspinatus, has some severe atrophy change. So if you take a still picture of that, and this is the image that I like to get, if you line up the spine of the scapula with the infraspinatus in short axis and the teres minor in short axis and then the long head of the triceps in long axis, you get this beautiful picture here with teres minor looking beautiful and hypoechoic and healthy, infraspinatus looking echogenic and atrophic by virtue of the fact that you've got a spinoglenoid notch ganglion compressing the suprascapular nerve at this level. This is another example of a a spinoglenoid notch ganglion here. So you can see on this video beautifully how close the posterior labrum is to the spinoglenoid notch. So it's a really close relationship. You can't really see any evidence of a tear here in this posterior labrum, unlike the previous case. But in this case, you can still see a large paralabral cyst. And in this case, we've used some Doppler. In fact, we've used SMI here. And that shows that this is the position here of the suprascapular artery. So the suprascapular nerve runs in a neurovascular bundle, and this artery is displaced by this paralabral cyst, and that's why it's not working. It's dysfunctional. So then when we look at the muscle bellies in this person, and we can look at the muscle bellies in long axis, as we're doing in this image here, or short axis here, and now we're spinning around into short axis here as well, the infraspinatus is small compared to teres minor. It's echogenic and, uh, and showing classic atrophy changes. So this is again, this is a case of de-innovation of the infraspinatus by virtue of the fact of a posterior labral tear and a paralabral cyst. If I saw this exact same pattern in a 70 year old person that had a long standing tear of the supraspinatus tendon that was then involving some of the infraspinatus, that would cause exactly the same ultrasound appearance as what you're looking at here. However, in this case, we've got a person that had a perfectly healthy rotator cuff, no tears, and they've got the posterior labral tear and the de-innovation because of that paralabral cyst. So it's important to have a look at the, the whole picture with the patient to work out whether you think it is simply the product of an old rotator cuff tear, whether it's the product of a paralabral cyst from a labral tear, or whether it's the product of something like Parsonage-Turner, where the ultrasound will show no abnormalities at all of the tendons or the spinoglenoid notch or the suprascapular notch. The only thing that you'll have is muscle atrophy change. So beautiful example here of teres minor looking lovely and infraspinatus being atrophied and, uh, and that's simply because of that paralabral cyst. What about quadrilateral space syndrome? So quadrilateral space syndrome is the fancy name given to dysfunction of the axillary nerve. So if we look at the axillary nerve here, it comes out and it innervates these two muscles. It innervates the teres minor here and the deltoid over here. So if you have a inferior labral tear, then this can cause a paralabral cyst that can then interrupt the function of this nerve. Humeral fractures, dislocations, heel sacs deformity from, so a fracture from a dislocation, which is often accompanied by a bank art fracture as well, will definitely then lead to dysfunction of the axillary nerve, and this will then cause atrophy of teres minor and some related deltoid muscle atrophy as well. And the name we give to this pattern is quadrilateral space syndrome. So this is the picture I like to do it. So it's exactly the same picture as I did when I was looking at the infraspinatus for atrophy change. But what we're seeing here is we're seeing preservation of infraspinatus and we're seeing atrophy of teres minor. This is the long head of the triceps coming out underneath here and this is the posterior deltoid. So again, using the posterior deltoid as a reference, you can see that the infraspinatus is healthy, teres minor is atrophied.
if we look at that in real time, you can see as I scan through, that's the infraspinatus, that's beautiful, but then that's teres minor, and you can see how thin and echogenic it is, and then when we spin into the short axis of those two muscles, you can see that selectively, only one muscle has been affected, and it's teres minor. So this is consistent with an auxiliary nerve dysfunction. So we start with the transducer here, and this should show beautiful, nice, healthy muscle. And then we slide the transducer down, and this will show a long axis view of the teres minor uh, and show the atrophy change. And then we turn the transducer 90 degrees to get that beautiful comparison picture where we can see both muscles next to each other. These are more examples of quadrilateral space syndrome. So you've got a very small and echogenic atrophic teres minor preservation of infraspinatus. It's a very simple pattern to observe, and it gives you the diagnosis. Another example where we can see on, on this side here, we have the normal comparison side. So that's infraspinatus, and now we come down to teres minor. Everything is lovely and hypoechoic. We can swing into the short axis, and we've got this beautiful, symmetrical, lovely two muscles here that are nice and hypoechoic. There's the long head of the triceps there. And then if we look at the symptomatic side, you can see that the muscle here, which is teres minor, is small compared to infraspinatus. It is very hyperechoic compared to infraspinatus, and this is consistent with atrophy change. So in summary, if you look at the posterior shoulder innervation, we've got four muscles that we're interested in back here. And of course, the supraspinatus and infraspinatus get their motor drive from the suprascapular nerve. That has to go through the suprascapular notch and then the spinoglenoid notch being two points where it is vulnerable to, to compression effects. And these are the two muscles that, that this uh, single nerve is innervating. And then we have the auxiliary nerve that takes care of the teres minor muscle here and then the deltoid as well. And of course, this nerve can be damaged from dislocations and other short sorts of shoulder trauma. So I hope this makes sense. I hope that you're very clear on looking at the muscles around the posterior shoulder now. And you can think in terms of atrophy that is caused by rotator cuff tears in the chronic setting, atrophy that is caused from deneuralization, as I've been discussing, and also atrophy that's caused by a more central type of deneuralization, which is Parsonage Turner, which is a type of brachial plexus neuritis. If you think of it like wiring and, and light globes in the house, I think it all makes perfectly good sense. And then, of course, you can supplement these images also with the long and short head of biceps image, my so-called butterfly view. And then you've really got a good global idea about the health of the muscles right around the rotator cuff. The only muscle that we don't have great access to is the subscapularis muscle, and that's because it is sandwiched between uh, the scapula and the chest wall, so unfortunately we can't get a good look at it. I hope you've enjoyed this. Happy scanning, and bye for now.